Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Christos Anisti. The Gospel reading this morning is about our Lord Jesus Christ praying to the Father. And he teaches us how to pray in John chapter 17 that one of the main things that we should always have in our hearts and our minds when we pray is unity. Unity. He begins the Gospel reading today, he says, I have given them the glory which you gave me, that they may be one. Why have you given us this glory? That they may be one just as we are one. He's speaking about the unity of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's praying, our Lord, why does, why does he want us to be one? And he repeats multiple times throughout his prayer in John chapter 17. He says that they may that the world may know that you have sent me, that the world may know that you have sent me. And he says again earlier on, he says that they may be one as we are one. He repeats it in the, in, again a second and a third time in the prayer. The reason that he's praying for our unity is for people to know that the one that we worship is the true God. The one that we worship is the true God. Because if there is division amongst us, there's many times on the Sundays throughout the readings of the church that we talk about the division. And our Lord Jesus Christ rebukes the Pharisees and scribes and says, if the house divided against itself, how can it stand? And this house starts with ourself, our thoughts that are divided against ourselves. We have a thought that tells us rise and pray. Another one that says remain sleeping a little longer. We have a thought that says be faithful in your work. Another one says, cut some corners and try to make a name for yourself. And we have to choose between these thoughts. We have to have a united way of thinking. Or else we ourselves will feel like we're pulled to and fro and we're confused, unable to stay steadfast in the path that we have paved, whether in our professional life, but most importantly in our families, between spouses, spouses and children together, siblings together, grandparents, in-laws, in the service, people serving together in different services. Unity is the most important thing that we can offer to God. That's what he prayed for, the unity, the oneness. And God is capable of giving us this grace of the oneness. That's why he prays for us. And in John chapter 17, it's one of the two prayers that our Lord Jesus Christ himself prayed for us that are still alive now. He said that he doesn't just pray for us, but he prays for those who will believe because of those whom he was discipling at that time, the 12 disciples and the apostles. That the world may believe that you sent me. Because if the world does not see Christ in us, as we were speaking about last night, if they cannot see the unity that exists in a family or a unity that exists in a service, then how can the people that are served be able to see that this is whom we worship, that the three are one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So. The gospel today is preparing us for Sunday in which we will hear the gospel of our Lord telling us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If he is the truth, then there is unity. There's no division in the truth. There's no falsehood in the truth. There's no thinking left and right in the truth. The truth is, is the truth. It stays as it is, irrespective of what happens. And the way is that single way. So. In today's gospel, we're called to unity, whether we're not reconciled with somebody or whether we're having awkwardness in our conversations, to make the commitment in our prayers to say, God, give me the grace to reconcile, that I may have a pure heart towards all before I depart from this life. Because that is the most important thing that we have to have, is a pure heart. Concerning, by God's grace, we will have deacon ordinations today. The chanters and the, the readers will be appointed. So I just wanted to briefly mention that in the prayers themselves, if we're ordained chanters, if we have children or brothers or sisters that are ordained as chanters or readers, the prayers themselves teach us what we are supposed to be doing in that service. So if we pay attention to the readings that are prayed for the ordination of the chanter or the appointment of the chanter, then it talks about singing with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and praying with understanding from the depth of our heart and not having a spirit of pride and, and vainglory and boasting. That's what the chanters are supposed to be doing. 
everyone in the church is supposed to chant. And I remember as a child growing up here, I didn't know because this is the only church that I knew. But of course, may God repose his soul of Wunapshoi. He implanted in us the, 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 uh, the ability to know all the hymns by praising them all together. And when I started going around in, in different churches, I found that, yes, it's a gift that God has brought here to America, that we have our, our, the, the churches resounding with all of the people participating in the praises, but it's not everywhere. So I'm sure that Abun Abshoi and the fathers that are still serving here, may God give them grace. Abun Amorus, Abun Amritius, Abun Mark, Abun Akrilus, Abun Amina. They're, they're serving, and the unity of us praising together is very beautiful before God. So the chanters are supposed to know much more than just the normal responses. For the readers, I'll just mention one beautiful thing. In one of the prayers, you'll see that the bishop puts their hand not on the head, but on the temples of the reader, the person that's appointed to be a reader. And the, the bishop says, He's praying to God, he says, Great and loving God in whose hands all things are held. That's what he says after he puts his hands on the two sides of the temple of the reader. So the church is telling us, number one, by the cutting of the hair in the beginning, that this person is going to be able to read the scriptures to the people. So because they're reading the scriptures, they have, a, they have to have a pure mind. So all of the prayers are centered around having a pure mind and a pure heart so that we can properly interpret the scriptures to those who will hear. Not just to read them, but even to be able to explain them. So we have to know the readings before we come up here and read them. And number two, this idea of having the hand. So the cross, we make five cuts in the, in the hair because the hair is the closest thing to the mind. So we're saying, God, purify their mind that they may have the ability to interpret the scriptures faithfully. And we do it in the sign of the cross because we want them to have the mind of Christ, as St. Paul says. And then this second prayer in which we say, great and loving God in whose hands all things are held, that God himself will, will consecrate and sanctify this mind that it may be able to interpret. So it's not a, a small matter to be appointed to the rank of reader um, and chanter as well because we're called to, to, to raise the praises to God and to be leading the praises. May God grant us all to be faithful in the things we've committed to him in this life in our consecrations first and foremost in our baptism and in any service consecrations we've made throughout this life may we pray for one another in this liturgy to be faithful in that which we have offered to god and glory be to god forever Amen.